Hello all. Today I am sitting with Dr. Nina Sabnani from IDC. Nina is an artist and storyteller who uses film and illustration to tell her stories. She graduated in painting from the Faculty of Fine Arts in Baroda and received her master's degree in film from the Syracuse University of New York. She pursued that as a Fulbright fellow in 1997. Her research at IDC focused on Rajasthan's Kavad storytelling tradition, which we later talk about too in the podcast. After teaching for two decades in NID Ahmedabad, Nina has now shifted to Mumbai and she is currently a professor at IDC Bombay. Nina's interests in research include exploring the dynamics between words and images in storytelling. Her work in film and illustrated books seeks to bring together animation and ethnography. It was by chance that I found her taking a module for the design students at IIT Hyderabad and I approached her to have this little conversation and she was game. I must confide that I was a little fanboyish in front of her, even a little starstruck, as I couldn't materialize my ideas as articulately as I would have wanted. But she was still able to redirect the conversation to being more meaningful every time. It is a good talk for people interested in design, especially in the visual communication aspect of it. Initially, we talk about how Nina kept her career choices open and versatile, and it worked out well for her in the end. We discuss some of her works and how they came to be. or how she wrestles with dealing with serial artists from all over india i had some questions about the traditional art forms of india and their conservation and propagation towards which she provided some great insights at least they were new to me never thought of that before towards the end of the podcast we discuss a little about the world of art and creativity and their relative status in the turbulent times of social media in all it was definitely a very informative and meaningful conversation for me i hope you guys like it too For anybody interested in Nina's work they can head over to her website ninasabnani.com which is quite comprehensive in presenting all her work so without much further ado i present to you guys Nina Sabnani feeling at iit hyderabad is it your first time here uh, this is the first time on this campus i have come to the other uh, older one the make shift one but this is the first time here and uh, how do you find the place to be till now oh, it's it's in the making so i can see this huge campus i saw the model things are still happening they're coming into shape so Then there's lots that uh, has been done, and there's a lot I'm sure to be done. And I think it is not just the infrastructure, but even the processes of how things should be done, the academics, and the even that is in the process of still evolving. That I think is with every institution. <laughs> I'm sure you have ta- talked about a lot of how you came about to be in this field, but could you just briefly tell us about what uh, paths of choice you uh, took? How I came to do animation. Actually, I started off uh, wanting to be an artist. So I, I went to the Fine Arts College in Baroda, and I, I thought I would be painting for the rest of my life. But um, some of my teachers they felt that I should I would do better if I did animation, and they recommended me to go to NID, which had uh, just announced a fairly new. I mean, they never had this before a new program in animation. It was not my choice, but I was pushed into it, but once I was there and I, you know, I saw what the potential of animation was. I, I thought that that it was a good choice to have made, and I really thank those teachers of mine, uh, Jairam Patel and Nasreen Mohammadi, to actually make that thing possible for me. I mean, to see that potential in me. So you, now you think it was a very good choice. Yes, because <clears throat> initially I was not very impressed with the animation because I thought it was for kids, and you know I had only been exposed to, and most of us even today we are exposed to a certain kind of animation. We see mostly Disney or you know the kind of mainstream animation, which is mostly directed to kids, and 
and I was not interested in that because not because it's a bad choice for anyone, but it was not a choice for me. <clears throat> so I preferred to do things uh, that were more meaningful to me. But then I saw a whole bunch of films that uh, were from other countries where they had used <clears throat> many different means to animate uh, and, and as many themes and as many audiences. So that really excited me. Some were very political, some were very aesthetic, some were very emotional, you know, not all animation films were funny. So that made me see the potential of what I could do. And then we had a professor who came from England. Our first professor was from Disney. So it, he really tuned us into the whole craft of animation. Then the professor from England actually opened our eyes to you know, the possibilities of films. In a, he showed us films from Poland, from Zagreb, from the Film Board of Canada. And suddenly our eyes just lit up and even he encouraged us to use Indian themes, Indian uh, art. You know, I mean, he said there is so much indigenous art. Why don't you, uh, you know, take inspiration from that? Not, not appropriate it and use it, but take inspiration. So my first film uh, I did with Madhubani artists, which was on uh, the hills of Dowry. And that kind of set me on the path of working with communities. I didn't realize it then. I mean, I thought I was just experimenting with the form and also that it looked very nice and it was very challenging because how do you animate a Madhubani painting? It doesn't have the structure that, you know, animators create for their figures. So I, I think that was my beginning point. And then the film I made with my teacher, K.G. Subramaniam, uh, which he had made a film on summer story, which was a retelling of the Thirsty Crow. But his crow was a smart uh, urban fellow who, who got inspired by an ad and he took a straw and drank the water. <laughs> so I animated that. And, uh, so that I think those two films, I would say, they, they kind of laid the foundation for the kind of work that I do today. So, as you said, uh, initially you were only conditioned to know about animation in a sort of a, something that caters to children mostly. Do you think that is still the case in India right now? And uh, do you think there are significant changes or ideological changes coming across uh, the population to actually understand uh, how animation or any art form for that matter could bring a change? See, the change makers in India can only be people from advertising because if you see, you know, animation and advertising, that is not directed to children. But what is directed to children are all these mainstream, you know, the feature animation. In fact, because the funding, you know, if an independent filmmaker wants to make an animation film, the only funding that is available to them is from the Children's Film Society of India. And CFSI only gives money if, if it is directed to children. And then <clears throat> the other uh, big studios that are making, you know, there aren't that many animation features being made in the country. It takes a long time. And then you have, uh, you know, the distribution network is not as strong as, say, for Bollywood. So obviously, uh, you know, they, it's better that they cater to an audience that they, they know traditionally has been known to like animation. Children like animation. And uh, adults find, because children like it so much, adults probably think, and that because also of themes that are, you know, usually explored by animation, they, they think it's for children. And so even from teenager onwards, they don't know, they'd rather watch manga or anime, and, but not, uh, not that kind of animation. So there is, it's, it's a, uh, how shall we say, it's a catch-22, like, there is no audience, and then there are no films that the audience can, you know, so it's both ways it works. I don't know what can break it, like, um, when Disney films come, or, you know, uh, Pixar, or, you know, DreamWorks, when they bring films, you know, their films are shown worldwide, they also have a, a lot of history behind, you know, they have uh, advertised it so much, that people everywhere talk about it. There's a lot that is, you know, promoted. 
So we don't have that much promotion. We don't have that kind of funding to promote. Even if you make the film and it's very nice, there's no way to promote it. You need the funds to promote it. And uh, that also does not happen. So there have been films that uh, people have made in India, which are very nice uh, by, uh, you know, filmmakers. But lack of promotion and then, you know, the uh, distributors are such that, you know, if your film doesn't run for, if you don't have a full house for the next, you know, three, four days, it just take, it's taken off theaters. Then the other possibility is showing it in f film festivals and in um, TV. But there's no way that you can earn back from that. So therefore, it's not great business also. It's, it's only for the love of the art that people are you know, putting in their own money and, and making films. So we are still at that stage. Even uh, for uh, other countries, when they make films, they don't really earn from the films as much as they earn from the merchandise that they generate from it, that kind of, um, you know, uh, television rights that they sell. Um, obviously, the investors would always be looking for some sort of a payback, even if they want to put money in it. And um, that is why we see a lot of... See, the the, the uh, you know, Disney characters became very popular because they also appeared on TV so many times. Now, you see, when you're, when you're growing up with that, then you tend to like it, you know. I mean, TV habits are such. You may initially not like anything. But, you know, just by, oh, oh, you know, going over it, you know, seeing it every day again and again, you begin to associate with those characters, even though you're bored, you know, you don't like the story, but you will still watch it. And so people watch, you know, things that are there on TV. So how would you, now how would you compare to the times where TV had such a strong impact on the lives of people and now we can see it exponentially go down day by day and now it is individual devices so where does and now of course it also increases the size of the audience because now everybody has a problem. also decreases it because now see tv imposed certain things onto you they showed you so whether you knew of their existence or not uh, you you were made to see it but <laughs> when you when you have it on your own device and you have the choice how will you look for something you don't know exists? So you will only look for things that exist or somebody has talked about. There is no way of knowing. So on the, on the technology makes it possible for lots of people to access it, but uh, it doesn't give the means. And there's where, that is where the power of advertising and pushing of uh, certain things comes into play. If the animator can afford it. I don't know. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, like... How do we know, how do we look for a film? We say, oh, somebody told me about it. Or we'll say, this won the Oscar this year, we must watch this film. I mean, there are ways by which uh, these things come to our attention. Or it is trending for some reason. Yeah, if it's trending, you know, like, that's how you see, you know, even on your Instagram, things that are trending will pop up, you know, on Facebook also, the stories this week. It's not, uh, it's how many times somebody saw this, that that comes on top. The rest are lost. And also uh, people, I don't know, that's what I have observed, that people tend to follow the trend just so that they also feel a part of like, okay, I have also seen this in today's scenario. No, in to always, I mean, you always read the news, newspapers, so you were on top of things, you know. You know it's not to say that newspaper is some divine, you know, information. It's, it's, just, it's just that somebody thought this was important to tell. <laughs> and you think that is news. <laughs> And news is everywhere, there's information everywhere. But what we choose to focus on depends on who is uh, who thinks it's important. Especially, uh, I would wonder, because animation is something that, at least in today's uh, day and age, anybody can do with a computer. And so that just increases the size, of, increases the number of content. And uh, because of that, I think people who are actually basing their a careers or their, not the careers but their whole uh, uh, expectations and lifestyles uh, towards animation if the mediums like YouTube get flooded with so much content I think does that also create a problem no it doesn't I mean you know if you have a good search engine and you have you know you can search things properly uh, with certain keywords you know actually we have more access 
earlier i used to wait and wait for some film festival to show a film that i'd heard of or read in a book now i can go to youtube and look for it because then my teaching becomes very interesting because i can show examples from you know all over the world without having to write to those people or write to the you know archives and say can you please loan us this film for this class um i think uh, vimeo youtube are excellent uh, broadcasters for animation <laughs> it also uh, gives a sort of an independence to the creator the creator is so much more empowered because the person can make their own film like earlier it would be impossible to make a film on your own because you had to get 30 you know 35 or 16 mm film for which you had to have a license you had to have these huge cameras then you had to have a laboratory who would process it then you needed a then video made those things simpler but even then you had to have this heavy end equipment which each was you know dis- discrete so editing machine was discrete from the camera now you can pretty much do things uh, with a laptop and a phone yeah <laughs> so uh, nina let's talk a little about some of your works uh, mukund and riyas was it something you did for your college I didn't do it for a college uh, but it was uh, actually uh, it's it's my father's uh, story of of his experience of the partition and uh, he had uh, you know told me about it like once when he was very sick and he thought he was going to die and he he started telling me about his uh, you know childhood and and uh, you know because he was uh, ill and not able to go anywhere i had i, I used to spend time with him like and i used to just make no- notes you know, like whatever he's telling me i thought i would just put it together to share with my siblings because not ever, you know you, you never get to know your parents that much as you know even your friends so, because you your parents relationship with your parents is more like are you okay do you have enough to eat are you you have money you know that kind of very subsistence level kind of communication and of course you know when we were younger he would teach us you know so he was also a teacher so but this was like a you know like a, a friend you know chatting with you and telling the stories so i shared this with my family and, and i left it at that and uh, i also shared it with some friends who who said you should make this into a film right like, but then at that moment uh, there we had a um, arrangement with another school in israel which was uh, funded by unesco and they wanted to make uh, they had a festival on uh, making films animated films on the rights of children so there was some funding there so which is when uh, our, our our institute uh, nid decided to fund our students and faculty to make uh, short films on the rights rights of a child so in that sense i made the film so in in that sense you could say it was uh, you know initi- it was initiated by me and funded by uh, various organizations so were you a student at that time no, no, no. you were teaching so i time? i i i guided my students on this topic and i also side by side made my own film and uh, was there any particular reasons why you used fabric as a medium of course um, my father he worked in the print even the textile industry so he was a printing master in his uh, early years and uh, he came from sindh where they do a lot of you know embroidery and applique work a suf bharat kaam so and he had he had said very categorically that i cannot convert him into a cartoon character if i had to make a story of him and and i thought that i had seen uh, somewhere uh, in kutch people had made uh, figures out of cloth so that was the inspiration and then i made my own drawings and found uh, people to do the applique so i felt it it spoke uh, also for my father because he was from the textile mills and so all the fabric that i had seen him look at growing up 
you know, some pieces were there from his own shirts, some were from, you know, swatches he had collected. So the patterns were all coming from, as you say, things that he might have collected or... Not only he had collected, I also had friends, you know, in, in Baroda who uh, had uh, this print, you know, they were doing screen printing and block printing. So I got, fab, you know, waste material from them and, and made things from them. While making this story, uh, this uh, movie, was it any different from making other movies? Because you had a personal relation to it and uh, so many things that even you might be discovering for the first time. Definitely. It was, uh, I think it, it was a very different experience. And I think from then on, I, I, I felt that I would, I enjoyed working with people telling their stories. So that, therefore, the next film that I made, which was with the Kachi artist, uh, was again telling their stories. And uh, because they also migrated, you know, they migrated in 71, 72. And my, my father migrated in 47. But both were, you know, migrations due to a war with, between India and Pakistan, where, uh, you know, once upon a time it was one land and now suddenly there was a border and uh, people had to decide where to live. So this notion of displacement and, and the Kachis were displaced even twice because they had the earthquake. So one, the loss of land was because of moving. The other loss of land because of a natural disaster. But it, it unearthed that memory of the earlier displacement. So it, it rattled them to such a, you know, that was very traumatic. And the art was the way by which they kind of came to terms with it. And they wanted to talk about it. So therefore, I felt from then on, you know, I, I found a path for my own, you know, like a niche for myself as to what I would like to do. Because nobody was doing that kind of work in animation. I was going to In ask, India, I mean. Yeah. Uh, I was going to ask this question later, but I think I'll ask it right now as, because you brought up brought it up. Uh, how do you make sure that when you're collaborating with someone, their work doesn't get overshadowed or what they have to say doesn't get overshadowed? It never does. In your case, I've seen the movies. It never does. But how do you manage that? And I'm sure when you're working with a team, how do you make sure that their story, their opinions uh, stay in the same place? And you also get to uh, input your own creative side. So we, we uh, it, it, everything evolves, you know, because this is, uh, you cannot predict what they will say. <laughs> but you can at least plan what you will ask, like you are doing just now. You, you have made your set of questions, you are asking me something, you don't know what I am going to say. But then, uh, uh, whatever they say, uh, it leads me to ask more questions. You know? So, so in, that is my my collaboration, and their thing is to tell what they feel, and then we use their voices itself, you know, in the film, so that uh, there, you know, you can actually hear them say things for themselves. So there isn't an interference of that kind. The other non-interference is the form itself, you know, the things that they create. Uh, we do not interfere with the way they orient things or in fact we learn from you know how okay so in their world there is no one point perspective in their world there are multiple perspectives and that kind of you translate it into multiple voices talking about it you know multiple uh, ways of telling that story and that's how it evolves it was very uh, interesting to see the same incident that you're talking in the story of Kavar where parallel stories were going on and both were given equal light. And the third story was of the investigator. <laughs> yes. And uh, it is also sort of a comment on uh, Indian uh, Hindu religion also because they also have a lot of parallel stories going on. Wherever you go, uh, the same story will be evolved in a certain, a little different manner. And um, it was very refreshing to see that sort of an approach. It also, I mean, I, what excited me, you know, about that was that um, there is nothing called an original. There are only versions of it, you know. 
and and that emanates from many things one is the context in which uh, that story is created uh, so that same story from uh, 13th century will be different to 16th century but you will hear the same story but the focus would have changed you know so okay. times like there is a there is a lovely uh, uh, story about uh, uh, it's called tuti nama is the tales of a parrot simsar so uh, it, it, it's a, uh, the baseline never changes the baseline is there is a man who has to travel a lot leaves his wife behind uh, and he she uh, has a and he, he entrusts her security to the parrot in the house and he says you take care of my wife and she is attracted to another man because this man is away and every time she decides to you know like steal or like she she thought she thinks she'll go and meet that other man in the night but uh, the parrot kind of uh, uh, very cleverly you know involves her in a story so he tells her of oh, you're looking so beautiful you're looking like this lady he says who's this lady you don't know i'll tell you her story so he'll drag on and ra- drag on till it's morning then of course she cannot leave so he does this till the gentleman comes back and he takes care of his wife in, as a soldier of sorts you know now the same story uh it in over the centuries have very different endings or you know like renditions so in one story the husband when he comes back the parrot tells uh, him that you know your wife was planning to run away with some guy i saved her and he kills the wife in another story he kills the parrot in another story he decides not to travel so much you understand so it depends on the society the way the culture is evolving that the stories also change and that is and also the storyteller himself in the case of the kavar you could see that one storyteller he he was very specific he had more details the other one just talk, talked about events from one event to the other he just told the story in that way and he assumed that you knew a lot so they of course draw on the uh, like if i show this film uh, in another culture i they find it difficult to accept it because hi uh, who is ram and who is this, this i, I remember him mentioning ram not as just as ram just saying bhagwan mm-hmm. and you are supposed to already know what bhagwan means that's why in the english i write lord ram because nobody mm-hmm. will know what <laughs> uh, could you talk a little about the contraption the equipment was was it covered uh, that they had is that called a cover okay so can you tell us a little about it because it seemed very interesting it is a it's a portable shrine uh, in fact my phd is on on the cover tradition so uh, i spent like good 5 6 years you know just researching this and uh, what i found that it is something that is like a portable pilgrimage you know and is it's interesting because it is connected to shravan who took his parents on a pilgrimage that is there uh if you see the box it it is like it's not a replica of any shrine nor is it a miniature temple of any kind it has uh, you know it has these folding doors they open and in in some of the panels there are stories in some of the panels there are pictures of the patrons so you can commission him to get your image painted in it so it's like being close to the gods you know being inside the thing and they believe the patrons believe that the st- storyteller brings this box this shrine from varanasi from kashi they say so it is very sacred they when it comes to the house it sanctifies the house and it also uh, he also reads their genealogies apart from telling the stories are very brief they are, he assumes they know it so ramayan will be ram lakshman ki jodi shan mein lanka todi the end that's ramayan okay that's done and there are two images of ram lakshman with the thing and you know you are supposed to know the rest okay so he this he will chant is really like a priest he will chant in the genealogies and in some cases he will the genealogies will take them back to some god 
like his genealogy takes him to Shravan and uh, then being a nephew of Dashrat, therefore being a cousin of Ram and, you know, creating these kinship bonds with these uh, gods. And uh, for the, like a Jat, he'll say, you are from the Jatas of Shiva. That is why you're a Jat, you know. And he'll tell uh, Sutha that you're the child of Vishwakarma. So, in, in and they all absolutely believe it, you know. And it's not like... Uh, he is telling them they also have this belief and he reinforces that. And these stories are like arranged in a way that they start by, you know, very stories of hardships, then stories of, you know, community bonding, then stories of visiting a, a, you know, a temple and, you know, there's a Ganges flowing, that there's Bhagirath and, you know, you, you, bathe in that water just like you do in a pilgrimage so that's uh, what the whole thing is and the people who make the kavad are different from the ones who recite it i also noticed that whenever they opened the kavad uh, they would always brush the gods with a peacock feather so any significance to that oh yeah because it's a uh, peacock feathers are supposed to be very uh, pure as in they take ward of evil you know so so nothing should, you know, you have seen that even in a, a, a Gurudwara. There is a chauri, whatever it's called, you know, they they brush the book, the holy book with something. In dargahs, in Sufi dargahs, you will see that uh, the, the priest will take a bunch of peacock feathers and he'll hit you with that. It's sort of warding of evil around you. So, uh... Moving on to your other project, Ham Chitra Banate Hai. It seemed very interesting. Unfortunately, I was not able to find the full version of it. It's not there. <laughs> it's not there? <laughs> we have not put it. Um, we, uh, we have a Vimeo version which we give if somebody wants to watch it uh, with the password. Because there is an arrangement uh, with Tata Sky. They were showing it. So, we they had said that we cannot put it on YouTube. I mean, we can't make it accessible. Otherwise, how will people so on that channel? No? So, so what was the story there? Firstly, how did you end up even knowing about the people who do this, and how then how did you go about approaching them and talking to them and working on this project? Uh, I I saw their work in a mela, you know, they. I mean, we, we have seen uh, being in Bombay and then also traveling uh, considerably. I Whenever there is a fair somewhere, I go for it. I go to see like where these people are coming. Because this is how I I came across the Madhubani art in Ahmedabad also. There were people, artists coming from. And of course, that has considerably changed now. The, the, uh, there are many more, you know, middlemen and those kind of people coming to these fairs. Earlier, and because they're also asked to pay, like in Delhi Heart, they are supposed to pay and uh, you know, it's not free for them anymore. Earlier, it used to be free, so more artists used to come. And, uh, and so I, I saw, I was traveling in uh, Bhuvaneshwar <laughs> and I came across this guy's art over there. And I had heard that there were, that the Bheels have many stories on water. So, I mean, I met I met him and I said, you know, oh, would you be interested to, I would love to make a film with you. So, he said, sure, he doesn't know what is film, but he said, okay. <laughs> so, he gave me his number and uh, then we forgot about it. I wrote, I was writing a proposal at that time to, you know, work on a film and I wrote this off. And... Uh, because I need to work with the community, you know. I cannot work uh, on my own. What will I work with on my own? You know, I, 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 even if I have a narrative, but I didn't want to. I don't work that way. I work with the people and their narratives. I'm just doing the telling. So uh, then, uh, one thing led to another. I got the funding from uh, Data Trusts, and uh, I, you know, approached them. And uh, he, so this person whose number I already had, he came to Bombay and we had a little workshop. And then from there, uh, in conversation, we just asked, why do you paint? And then he told us the story of why they paint. And we thought that would be the story to animate. 
uh, in one of your talks you mentioned about how they considered the dots as their ancestors yeah yeah so why do you use dots so it says each dot is an ancestor so imagine a, a figure is like a universe of people of of absent people <laughs> it, it was a very powerful idea you know with which to work and uh, then you also mentioned that because of that you thought it would be an unjust to keep them stationary yeah. so every frame even in the trailer i could see that every frame every the dots frame. were moving and it created a sort of a surreal effect because they live in this very hypnotic world of the real and the imaginary you know for them uh, uh, it is as a ration i mean i if i call myself a rational person then when i hear the stories of you know from rama and mahabharat i know i call them stories okay but for sher singh and he, you know uh, and people uh, in his community uh, that thing exists that sarichiri exists you know sarichiri is going to show us the way the badwaji is going to tell us this badwaji is going to i will take up he i went with him uh, we were traveling with him he had he was carrying this piece of mud to so what are you doing he says nahi wo badwa ji ko batayenge he will tell um, me how that land is from that land he took the earth so whether he, what he should whether he should build a house on it or whether he should do agriculture on it so this fellow he he felt the uh, that earth and told him on this land uh, you build a house on this land you do agriculture ye dono ko alag don't mix them up so that kind of uh, relationship with the imaginary and the real for me it's imaginary but for him it's everything is real that feeling to create this through this throbbing thing of the dots because you you don't know if it's there it's not yeah. there the reality is oscillating between yeah. both the dimensions yeah. yeah it is it is surprising we as a civilized society tend to uh, you know categorize and judge very quickly uh, people and not put ourselves in their shoes and try to imagine what what all is ingrained in their rationality and what can we learn from it because um, i i feel my my way of looking at the world or even experiencing things is much enlarged by engaging with them rather than you know see see it as uh, as somebody from the outside going to intervene in their lives and and make their things you know bring their things to the world and you know play this hero role i mean it's it's for me it's more of my own and uh, uh, you know learning it's it's uh, and the thing for me to be engaged like that it, it takes a lot of self truth and self honesty to actually say that and uh, not a lot of people have that sort of a mindset going into uh like when they come across a new art form or uh, any new knowledge they don't come across it just to experience it and uh, internalize it but i think that's a good way to approach new knowledge so in a lot of places you have interacted with various communities so if somebody else wants to do that would you recommend anything to them <laughs> be open that's all i i think uh, we are more uh, you know all of us are conditioned to speak more than listen so listening is important i mean the first thing in in such a if you want to engage because and and to to observe to listen to uh, to to also hear what they are trying to say and are not able to say because um, a lot of them are marginalized and that notion of being marginalized it comes through in a lot of their stories but we should be able to catch it and then and then to you know say it because um, the film should be as much for them as it is for the world it's one thing like i want to make a film so it's it's something that i create i am the so it's one product of mine but it is also that this product it does things to people you know the fact that i'm going to them that i'm talking to them that you know even like even if we are collaborating we are showing 
it is altering his world in in a lot of ways that as it is altering mine so he should when it's over uh, that sense of satisfaction i have he should feel it too he shouldn't feel somebody took something away from me but i think that's very important um i've seen many a times a lot of branded uh, companies like brand big names they start off with a very good uh, notion of helping the craftsmen and in a lot of times in the capitalistic world they end up at the end they end up exploiting them and then it is only the tag that remains and nothing else yeah one very important uh, thing that i found out in a lot of your works when i was watching your movies the world my world sort of stood still i don't know whether you have intentionally kept them very within a 15 minute range uh, i found it to be a very perfect time to to see get across the message that was trying to be said also it didn't cause a very elongated sense of uh, time also in a lot of places you have focused on very small things and uh, they have come out to be very important for example in mukund and riyas there is that cap in uh, kavad there is obviously the kavad and uh, in the hum chitra banate hain i was just mesmerized by the dots because i couldn't see the full story so so is that intentional or uh, if it is then what is the reasoning behind that so this is uh, these are uh, i mean each each of them are different things actually so the cap in mukund and riyas is the hook you know it's the you need one small hook by on which to revolve the story around because you are talking about a very big thing like partition but you know it's your the partition is as a concept is a huge thing but in individual lives it was translated into so many different things for my father it was his loss of a best friend and the best friend is like is you know in a way you know symbolized by the cap which was the dearest thing to him which he gave it because he had nothing else to give him and on the and and that when he told me this it i did it struck a chord in me that you know that the cap which you know you know in in our culture cap also means so many things right pagri hai you know it's like giving your honor to somebody and in in his in his friend friend also gave him his cap to disguise himself so in a way it is an exchange of two hats or two caps and and the the on they honor each other and their friendship by by this exchange so it was a very powerful idea and it became the hook of the film so in, in the beginning riaz wants the cap he will not give it to him in the end he gives it to him so that is that is the way the story ends also because you have a, a beginning and an end so you you know something that was there in the beginning you know it is it's something happens to the end and in between all these other things are happening and the the friendship that they share that the places where they live the activities of of his everyday life and uh, and that being you know pulled away from or pushed into a boat and you know sent away Okay so you just said that you don't want to have very big world views on things like animation and the world of animation I want to ask you you have been a teacher for a very long time I want to ask you whether you've seen a significant change in the attitude and aptitude of students that you've taught throughout time for example yeah well, any any student like I was a student who who was you know bowled over by uh, things that I saw and things that my teachers said uh so i think for a, any student you know it, it nobody is born with the uh, you know an understanding of the world you know they're making sense of it as they're growing and it depends on what all they're exposed to uh there's much more competition amongst peers today and you know there's much more anxiety about the future which i didn't have but you know i see my students have even today now today is much more than there was before although the opportunities are more today than there were before but somehow the world is the way it is uh, and i think uh, 
niche generation i see there is a need you know i mean there are always students who want to do you know they want to explore they want to experiment they want to do something different i see so many of my students now you know leading the industry also you know doing great stuff so i think as a teacher your own, your role is mainly to get them excited about something once they can you know claim it for themselves they don't need you they can do it on their own it is like bringing them to their to that gate and then just just like that's the part i mean these are so many paths you know you choose but at least get them excited about that adventure about going forward and not getting scared are there any looming problems that you have seen from far away but you see are not being addressed i'm talking in the context of students itself students and their world and their lifestyle maybe the technological impositions that are coming across mm mm-hmm. i think the more uh, you know technology i, I mean i love i love technology because it's allowed me to do so many things in my work but there is there is a some there is something that can happen and people who are born into technology are also you know they they uh, they are very scared of doing things by hand or you know or 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 doing a lab okay let me put it this way in in uh, when i was growing up or you know people around me work was germ, you know was something most important if i didn't work i felt like i was you know there was something terrible going on in my life and so uh and everybody only even in fine arts people spoke about work in design people like what are you working on now you know your work defined you you know it gave you that personal uh, the identity or something whereas today i find that uh, there is a distinction that people make between work and pleasure so they even students have this notion of i'm going to class and now is my social time you know so uh, and and i i must have my vacation and i must have this holiday and i must experience the world i must uh, travel i must have some adventure which is not a bad thing so they they are pretty figured in that way that they do not want to only be working and so that is fine but the other thing is they're not uh, they're because they have so much exposure no over exposure that they are literally scared to try out anything sometimes ignorance is bliss you know you try out things because you don't know you know you just jump into it but they already know so much and the moment you say something they are first they run to the machine to see you know what what all they can find out about it and sometimes it stops them from actually doing anything but you know each each era has its own set of you know things that will work for them won't work for them the problem for them is they don't they uh, they they mistake knowledge i mean they mistake information for knowledge and therefore they're very um, they're not so uh, how shall we say in in uh, we when we were students whatever our teacher said whether we agreed or not we we there was a you know we felt like okay they are telling us from their experience today you have to convince your students you know the student has been convinced that what you are saying makes sense because he has so many teachers he has access from so many things so it, it's a smart student will make the best of both the worlds and some will just reject something because they feel they already they already know it you know so right. these are the challenges of teaching uh, these days to add to your earlier point Uh, i personally experienced this myself also uh, one day i was trying to i was planning to make a bird house i'll make a house for birds out of uh, you know that oil canister that we have and i just went to the internet to search for things my <laughs> i was my idiotic decision was to go on pinterest <laughs> and they came up with such beautiful designs that i felt very discouraged why should i even go about it i should i even do it and i think also would you also agree to uh, the fact that if somebody has achieved something in today's world they feel like uh, putting it in 
putting it in front of the world to uh, to let them see okay i have made this and because they would like the appreciation for that thing they tend to get very anxious that it should be show worthy it should appeal to a larger audience if not the correct audience yeah you are doing it for the world you are not doing it for yourself <laughs> <laughs> it's it's like when you, you you wanted to make that bird house if you had a bird in mind you know like this bird comes to this tree and you know all this bird feels like he comes to my window but he has, you know in the rain he's sitting here he has nowhere to go and you make something for him you'll feel that pleasure you will get you won't care whether you know somebody likes it doesn't like it looks nice doesn't but the bird has to like it <laughs> bird should want to go and sit in it <laughs> and, and eat his food <laughs> i don't know the i think we were talking about this earlier also that people are very afraid to just do things i really point? i feel like i wish i could take that fear out of that student you know like get on with it it's okay you can make mistakes you only learn from your mistakes nina but on the same point i would want to ask you whether because of the over exposure there is also a sort of a level of expertise that everybody wants to achieve now now a bird house is not just a bird house but in the world of bird houses the people have made such great innovations that i don't think would have been possible before because there was no such competition and people are taking everything to the extreme like uh, everything just has to be the absolute best uh, but how do you describe best i mean you know uh you're seeing it from a particular aesthetic and you think that is the best and you know it is innovative but the more important thing is who are you building that for and what do you want that that bird to experience any advice to the students don't be afraid <laughs> just uh-huh. do it <laughs> i think uh, you everybody has to find what they want to do with animation uh or whatever that they're, they're doing because to to start with the idea that you will make something outstanding and new is a very bad place to start because then you will never begin because you, there'll be ev- it has already been done so many things are already been done you you yourself said you know you saw you went to pinterest and you said aha now what do i do so it's not about that i think uh, things that already exist in animation like uh, for me i am still wondering what to do with it okay so i like look at ah uh, i have already done i've done so much work now with community i have kind of said to myself that yes this is a nice approach i have evolved for myself somebody else wants to follow it it's up to them it's not such a new thing that i've done but uh, it it i am telling people stories with them that is something i have explored the next thing i want to explore is what can i do to animation you know like animation is seen in time so how do i see it in space how do i let the viewer view in their own time and not tell them you know in one single frame get their attention and you know like now now see this now see this now see it for this long so that's an exploration i don't know where it will take me but okay that's a question if you more you question about why you're doing what you're doing and who you're doing for or who are you doing with what do they want to say or how does the form of animation like if you look at it as a technology that it is you know it's a persistence of vision uh, it it moves in this way so when it moves very fast you see it moving so there are people who have explored that if suppose i draw the movements like that and i drive past very fast will i see it moving so so that is exploring with the you know the principles of animation the science of animation you can look at it with what do i do with animation and you think about uh, i work with communities or i work with children or i do with elderly and you know whatever issues that you know you address it or you look at you know what materials can i use to animate you know so so you find what excites you and then you go with that it takes you somewhere i mean finally uh, every you know discipline has grown because people have questioned so much about it you know? i'm on the same uh, same point i would like to ask there has been a recent 
surge of ambiguity among let's talk about the world of design uh, i i am also from a student of design and i've seen so many talented friends of mine uh, giving into the jobs of uh, ui and ux even though they had so many ambitions and they were hard working not just talented and uh, what they made was also like absolute marvelous and uh, but they gave into this so what would you say to them i can't say anything to them because they may have their own reasons you know so many of our animation students go into ui ux because they are the ones giving jobs giving them good money people want to earn better they want to have a good life i told you that work is not the most you know work is a means to an end not a end in itself so that paradigm shift has happened and therefore uh, people's uh, you know choices of what jobs to do is also shifting you know, what can you do i mean there are some things that uh, you know people do it for the love of it some people do it because what it allows them to do so the choices are so personal we cannot have an opinion on that one can only observe that this is what is happening so there are there are always the you know uh, uh, i mean you know in every field there are a handful of people that that take the you know the banner and run <laughs> they run to the horizon and try to push the boundaries not everybody does it you know we cannot expect that also just to bring a sort of a level of personalization to this conversation how would you say your perspective towards the world when you were let's say a student in your masters and your perspective of the world change now how has it differed and in that same line how what would you say to the students who might be going through a certain turbulence in their head regarding the world and what they should achieve at this point of time i can only speak for myself so yeah. i don't know if i can say anything to the students but when i was younger i always wanted i was very curious about the world far away what was beyond that horizon that yes what exists beyond now i'm more interested in what is around me and you know everything is speaking to me so that is a shift that has come because uh of time of exposure of you know thinking reflecting whatever i don't know but uh, not that the world beyond doesn't excite me but i feel uh that is more a way to like a, you know this thing a curiosity but but being in the space looking being conscious of the spaces around me and people around me it gives me a reason to live to do something also if i am not the one to tell the story of my environment yeah, yeah. who is better qualified to do that not better qualified why well, will anyone else bother <laughs> <laughs> on the same lines uh I, nid as a college encourages the students a lot to go and document and talk about various crafts and art forms uh do you think uh, the necessity of doing that is even more now and do you think uh, because of the radical growth of capitalism and industrialization and uh, consumerism is pushing back these art forms and uh, craft uh, crafts and are they being you know maybe not intentionally but are they being buried under the sheer flood of other things i don't know i mean um... you know crafts and the arts are always you know um, a part of the society you know they they uh, like when i was studying the kavad i realized that you know people say it's dying every we constantly talk about this art form is dying that art form is dying but it it was never it was always marginal you know it was always like something uh, that you know uh, in a, a king would you know bring some craftsman to his how you know to his um, thikana they they say in rajasthan and they will you know they would make things for the festival they would make things for the you know the palace and uh, he would give them a piece of land and say you know kheti karo and you know so they always had uh, two lives they had the life of you know the tilling the land you know making their food and then doing this 
Now what happened over the years, that kind of patronage is not there. So it, it, any of the, any crafts, you know, survive because of the patronage. So when the patronage will change, these things will go, you know. We don't know what all we have lost so far. You know. And, uh, we are not willing to pay for that, you know. As patrons, mm, we are, we are making these, uh, distinctions of what is art and what is craft, you know. And, uh, because somebody is, um, repeating something that uh, their forefathers did, then it is craft. And if it is an artist who has been to a college for four years and now thinks he's an artist, is bigger than that guy who's got the memory of thousands of years. It's a very un unequal kind of a judgment, you know, of what is art and what is craft. So as long as we have that kind of mindset, it is going to disappear. Some of these things will disappear because we are already seeing the children of the crafts people are not interested to do this because, uh, you know, you can't just do it only for the love of it. You have to make a living. Uh, you're asking about students who go to UI, UX. They, they, their uh, thing is the same. You cannot do something just for the love of it. You also have to make a living. So I see animation and the crafts also pretty similar, you know, on the, the being marginalized in some sense, because uh, it is something that uh, only uh, a patronage can save it. You know. And patronage doesn't mean being a king, you know. Patronage is you and I, you know, we we are willing to pay the price for something to to so that it endures, you know, because it's very hard for them to. Go on doing it. There's so many of them go on doing it because they have this mythologies that if they stop doing it, some disaster will befall them. You know? So they have to continue because they have been, uh, you know, entrusted by the gods to, to do this kind of work. Now, if they stop doing it, some calamity will befall them. So that, that belief is that the moment people all become very rational, all this will vanish, I think. <laughs> Funny and surprising how religious religions and belief plays yeah, a role in it. Belief systems, yeah, they do make you know make, make things. In some sense, they they keep some things alive, and some things they also create uh, horrible uh, discre di discrepancies between people and their worlds. Uh, before we end up this conversation, uh, uh, what are your future plans? Any any tentative ideas that you want to follow? There are, I mean, I have many ideas, but uh, none of them are finding the funding. <laughs> so I'm looking for funding and uh, I'm hoping to work on that. So one is, uh, uh, I'm working with an artist. Uh, I showed that bit uh, on that day and the paintings, you know, and then looking at uh, animation in space. So that is more like exploring the form of animation and its, its uh, use and uh, I also am, uh, I have been in conversation with uh, a community in Bengal that is um, involved in creating Katha, uh, in, you know, this uh, embroidery. And they are also migrants from Bangladesh. So, and they, you know, as in so many of the arts, uh, there are these questions of whom to teach, who will take this tradition forward. So that is, uh, that's a concern of mine. So that is something I want to do. Hopefully I'll be able to do it. Um, if anybody wants to find you or your work, where should, where can they go? I have a website. Um, they can go there. And uh, I have I have a YouTube channel. My films are on that also. I'm also working on uh, online courses. So the one that I'm working on right now is on uh, understanding ethnography, and this is an, a, a course for uh, designers, management people, engineers who are designing or making things for another. So how do you understand the other? Mm. You know, we do have uh, user studies and things like that, but that is very narrow in its focus. Ethnography is a much broader perspective. 
so uh, approach where uh, you know you are engaging with the other you're spending time with people in their own environments and you know uh, asking questions not just asking questions just hanging around them watching what they do how they do and, and hearing listening to them to understand what they need what are they happy about what are they this this you know concerned about and things like that and and from there to evolve a way of understanding who is this other for whom you are designing um, so where is this course if anybody wants to opt for it uh, so i only have one course it's called understanding design it is on swayam platform and uh, this one will also be on swayam they'll also through swayam it is also available on nptel okay and uh, can you just name your website neenasabnani.com okay well, that's pretty <laughs> straight forward uh nina it was wonderful to talk to you it was very informative to say the least and um, i wish you all the best thank you thank you so much thank you both.